And the theme of the next panel is here in this room, is changing balance of power in Asia. So please let me introduce the panelist from the right side, Mr. Hitoshi Tanaka, Chairman of the Institute for, for International Strategy, Japan Research Institute Limited. And next is Mr. Robert Luke, Minister Counselor for Political Affairs at the US Embassy, Tokyo. <laughs> and Mr. Philip Bowring, columnist for the International Herald Tribune. <laughs> and the moderator is, is Mr. Yoshita Hori. Okay, so welcome to our panel discussion theme is changing balance of power in Asia. Uh, in your program, it says that Rui Chengen, Chengen is going to be the moderator, but uh, uh, Chengen has decided to go to G20, not G1. <laughs> 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 but we all know that G1 is more important and, uh, <laughs> than G20, and uh, we all say that this is globe is one and group of one, and this is our theme. And today, uh, on this panel, we're going to talk about changing balance of power in Asia, and uh, the discussion will be more like the rise of China, and what about the role of Japan, and also the United States, and what's happening, and what is the position out there, and, uh, and so forth. With that, you know, we'd like to first of all start with uh, uh, Philip in terms of, you know, Philip is going to talk about what is the overview of what's happening in terms of Asia, and then we're going to ask Robert to talk about what is the uh, strategy and position of the United States. And we're going to ask Tanaka-san to talk about the issues facing Japan and what is the policy of Japan. So with that, we'd like to hand over to Philips for uh, your overview of the power balance of Asia. Uh, first. Uh, first of all, uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I have to make an apology. I'm no longer a columnist for the International Herald Tribune, and I'm now writing for the Wall Street Journal instead. Uh, but as uh, one of the sponsors of this meeting, I think that's probably appropriate. Uh, when we talk about balance of power in this part of the world, we always tend to think in the first place of the rise of China, um, and secondly of the uh, apparently uh, diminishing power, economic and uh, otherwise, of the United States. Uh, these are kind of... Uh, two rather obvious things uh, which uh, uh, tend to obscure a lot of the other things which are really going on around them. Um, so I think, first of all, we have to think uh, not about China and the United States, but about all the other players, and there are a lot of them. And Japan is at the top of the list of those other players, uh, rather obviously. Um, we'll come back to that in a, in a minute. Uh, but meanwhile, we've got these other uh, secondary and tertiary players um, who tend to be forgotten about uh, at, at this sort of forum. Um, first of all is, is Korea, uh, whether one Korea or two Koreas. Uh, secondly is uh, Russia. Russia is still very much a player uh, strategically in this part of the world. Um, thirdly, um, we have the uh, various nations of Southeast Asia. Um, now, it's often perhaps uh, forgotten that we have ASEAN, Association of Southeast Asian Nations, which isn't really an association at all. It's a, it's a, it's a grouping uh, which has had some achievements in the sphere of uh, economics, but very few in the sphere uh, of politics or strategy. Um, therefore, we have to look at the major nations of uh, this group uh, one by one to see how uh, they fit into uh, the overall strategic situation within the region, uh, as well as looking at them as a group as viewed uh, from Northeast Asia. So Northeast Asia obviously looks at them as a group, but they look uh, at Northeast Asia much more from a uh, national specific point of view. Uh, so we've got, uh, uh, at the top of the list, uh, Indonesia. Uh, for long, a, a sort of a, a quiet ally of the United States. Uh, we have uh, second in importance, I would say, is Vietnam, uh, whose uh, 
political transformation that has uh, had major uh, strategic consequences, which we see today. Um, then we have uh, the Philippines, which uh, counts very little in, in uh, most people's diplomatic uh, uh, assumptions. Uh, but nonetheless, and however militarily uh, enfeebled the Philippines may be, its strategic position is uh, uh, excelled only perhaps by that of Indonesia. Um, you know, particularly for those who begin to think of the issues of the South China Sea. Uh, and then we have some uh, lesser players like uh, Malaysia and Singapore. Um, so I think we can forget about them. But we do have, uh, in that group as a whole, we have a Malay identity, as far as Philippines, Indonesia, and Malaysia are concerned. And that is something uh, which should never be forgotten and is almost never even talked about. There is such a thing as a Malay identity which transcends the uh, differences of religion and so on that you find in the, in the Malay world. And uh, this is particularly uh, appropriate when one's thinking about the relationship between this Malay world and the Chinese world. Um, finally, we have, uh, to use a, a, a Russian phrase, uh, the near abroad, which uh, for, the, for our purposes uh, consists of uh, Australia uh, and India. Uh, Australia's relationship with the uh, US and China um, and Japan is obviously well known. Uh, India is paying increasing importance to uh, the eastern part of the Indian Ocean as well as to its relations with some Southeast Asian countries, particularly Vietnam, with which it's long had a relationship, and uh, also with Indonesia. And I think you're going to see this increase as uh, India becomes perhaps less paranoid about uh, Pakistan and sees that its uh, real strategic uh, interests lie in looking more east than, than west. Um, so we have an increasingly uh, uh, complicated situation um, in the region as a whole. So China is only one part of this, uh, of this equation. Uh, as for the U.S., yes, we can say that the U.S. is, is in relative decline, uh, but uh, we also know that part of that perception of relative decline has been caused by its obsession uh, with some issues in the Middle East over the last uh, decade or so. And uh, that is not necessarily a permanent situation, and I think we could well see, maybe we're seeing already, uh, certainly Secretary uh, Clinton has... Uh, given plenty of hints in this direction that uh, uh, this part of the world uh, re uh, requires much greater uh, attention from the US than perhaps it's had over the last decade. Um, then we, I think, have to bring in the situation of Korea. Uh, now, we really, no one can foretell what on earth will happen to Korea. Uh, whether unification is really on the cards in the foreseeable future or not. Uh, but clearly, a united Korea makes it, you know, roughly speaking, uh, you know, getting onto Japan's size in terms of, uh, uh, of the economy. Uh, once, you know, the north gets equal to the south, obviously, it's a, some, some way off, but not impossible. Um, but in those circumstances, you know, who is uh, Korea's natural, um, you know, Opponent, in a sense, I mean, Korea has always been uh, had this, you know, difficulty of a relationship with Japan and with China at different times in its history, and uh, therefore I think what, what you will tend to see is that actually um, Korea, a united Korea s would see a greater threat from from uh, uh, China than than from Japan. This is obviously the reverse of the history of the last 150 years, but anyway, that's. Uh, my perception, and I think also you see that in uh, Southeast Asia as well. Um, I mean, there are certain people in, in Southeast Asia who still go on about uh, uh, Japan and, 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 the, uh, uh, and the Pacific War, but the, the, the reality is, looking at today, that uh, um, Japan is a, is a friend, both in commercial terms and in, in strategic terms, uh, whereas uh, China has this hegemonistic view of its immediate neighbors. And uh, um, I think that comes across most clearly in all the issues related to uh, the South China Sea. 
Um, ASEAN uh, plus three, uh, good idea in, in economic terms, good idea in the financial cooperation terms, uh, but it's not going to gain a great deal of traction um, given current political circumstances and uh, China's ambitions uh, in the region, and therefore, which, which tends to set up uh, other people wanting to uh, counteract that rather than um, uh, cooperate with it. So uh, China and Japan and Korea all look to Southeast Asia and say, you yeah, know, we want to help you, but they, then, then it's more for their own interests. And meanwhile, the uh, Southeast Asians find it very difficult uh, to get their act together beyond uh, making statements and, and coming up with pieces of, of paper. Uh, Finally, I uh, should mention uh, demographics. Um, Japan's demographics is obviously, you know, fairly, uh, well, I wouldn't say disastrous, but uh, difficult. Um, but of course, China's are even more difficult in, in a slightly longer term. I, I mean, in another, you know, 20 years, China's will be looking much worse than Japan's today. And with the fewer opportunities to do much about it, uh, by way, whether it's by way of immigration or whether it's by way of uh, uh, increased fertility by, uh, through achieving greater uh, participation of women um, in the way that I think you have seen in, in, in many parts of the West where uh, birth rates have actually you know, gone back up um, in Scandinavia, France, and, and, and so on. Not everywhere, but there's certain you know, conditions which uh, create uh, a revival of, of birth rates, whereas China is obviously in a very difficult position with its uh, sexual imbalance. And uh, uh, so, from that perspective, uh, again, just finally, um, a note about I may sound much more negative about China than most people, but you know, probably I am uh, <laughs> living uh, in it. But uh, um, yeah, is is. China's economy gained to continue to expand so that you know, in 20 years' time, it will be uh, Japan except 10 times larger. And <laughs> the answer to that uh, is surely no, that China is in very serious danger of falling into the famous middle income trap. Uh, uh, and uh, demographics plays into this. Um, but the other reason, obviously, is its political system. Um, which uh, basically runs up eventually against its uh, idea for a competitive internationalized economic system, which would enable it to achieve the uh, uh, high level of, of, of income experienced by Japan and Korea and, uh, and Taiwan. So uh, I'll uh, leave it at that. Okay. Um, sorry, I probably over... Oh, that's fine. So thank you very much for your overview. And uh, I think it's, very, it's been very helpful to map out what's happening in Asia in terms of Japan, China, and the US, Korea, India, and also Australia, and Southeast Asia, and so forth. And uh, I'll be curious to hear Mr. Tanaka-san's comment about Japan-Korea relationship. You know, the position might be different from the uh, from Japan's side, uh, because you know, it might be much closer tie with Korea. At the same time, I'd like to get back to you about China. You seem to be skeptical about China. We'd like to hear more about that later on. So let's go move on to Robert to tell us about where you stand in terms of Asia and what is the diplomacy and strategy of the U.S. in terms of this, the power balance which is happening in Asia with all of you. Um, thank you very much. I um, appreciate the chance to be here today. Um, just as a little background, I've uh, spent uh, many, many years in, in Asia, mainly uh, between Japan and China. So I've had uh, three uh, Foreign Service postings uh, in, in both areas. So it's a topic of great relevance to me personally as well. Um, let me just start out by addressing the, uh, the relative decline issue. Um, <laughs> um, now, uh, relative is a, is a term that um, allows for many interpretations. Um, but uh, in terms of the final point you made uh, that we're seeing a redress of uh, the attention deficit to Asia, I think that is certainly true. Um, now, in addition to Secretary Clinton, uh, we just had our defense, our new defense secretary here, and he made it very, very clear on 
in every single meeting I was in that um, the U.S. Uh, will not only maintain its security presence in Asia, it will increase it. Um, and um, it's a question exactly of how we lay our forces out, but uh, we, we will stay here and uh, hopefully we will um, have more forward presence uh, going forward uh, than we have had in the past. Now, um, how do we do that? Um, obviously, we're facing a difficult budget environment, as you point out, um, and um, but at, at, on the same, by the same token, we are um, withdrawing from, from uh, Iraq. Uh, we're drawing down in Afghanistan um, and other areas. So in, in that sense, I think we have the wherewithal to, to maintain and increase our presence here in Asia. Um, of course, uh, our traditional alliances are going to be a big part of the strategy, and we continue to rely on those um, allies, um, first and foremost being Japan, of course, but South Korea also, Australia, Thailand, the Philippines, and others. And these have been very, very successful alliances. They've contributed tremendously to regional prosperity. Um, and certainly going forward, is, I think they're going to allow us uh, the strategic flexibility to, uh, to maintain and increase our presence here. Um, the, um, having said that, of course, uh, one of the other pillars, I think, of U.S. policy out here um, under this administration has been um, to take another look at regional institutions. Uh, we've been very aggressive in uh, pursuing that. Uh, we uh, joined the, um, the um, ASEAN Treaty of Amity and Cooperation, uh, and uh, that will lead up to President Obama's attendance at this year's East Asia Summit, which is... Uh, um, of course, along with Russia, uh, but I think a very important step uh, and a statement that we are making with respect to the regional architecture. Um, uh, obviously, we have uh, our uh, very strong interest in the TPP and uh, the more traditional frameworks, such as the six-party talks uh, that deal with the uh, North Korean nuclear issue. Um, so let me just move uh, very briefly and touch on a couple of regional challenges that we see uh, the first of which I just mentioned, uh, North Korea. Um, we continue to um, see a major challenge there. Um, obviously, North Korea has developed a, a pretty w capable uh, military apparatus, including uh, nuclear weapons and ballistic missiles. And uh, recently, we've seen um, efforts in the area of uranium enrichment and, uh, and a, a series of quite hostile and provocative acts uh, towards South Koreans. Um, with the uh, Chonan sinking and the shelling of Yongpyong Island. Um, so um, we need to maintain a very um, vigorous uh, uh, stance uh, toward North Korea to prepare for any eventuality. Um, uh, and of course, uh, North Korea encompasses a lot of other problems as well, uh, humanitarian um, issues, human rights, and, uh, and of course, uh, what uh, matters a great deal to Japan, the, uh, the uh, question of the abductees, uh, on which we're seeing uh, very little uh, progress. Um, so um, all of this is uh, laying out um, what we see as a, as a continuing difficult situation and a reason, very much a strong reason for us uh, maintaining our presence here. Now on the question of China, um, I think uh, our officials in Washington uh, frequently refer to this as the uh, most complex challenge that we will ever face in our lifetime. Mm. Uh, and uh, in many respects that is, uh, is true, and I think it applies to both the United States and Japan. Uh, how do we uh, work productively in to integrate China into uh, the global system uh, to uh, gain its uh, acceptance of the system that it has benefited from for so many years and uh, to work positively and productively in that system. Um, and basically accommodate a rise in China's power, which is inevitable given the economic um, rise that we see <clears throat> in a way that will not <clears throat> upset the regional um, order or stability. Um, now, our vice president was uh, in China recently, and when he got back to the U.S., he, uh, he wrote a uh, very interesting editorial 
uh, for the New York Times called China's Rise is Not <clears throat> Our Demise. And in that, he, he made the strong case that uh, looking at China's rise as a zero-sum proposition is uh, not only uh, mistaken, but uh, quite dangerous. Um, now, I, I happen to agree with that position. I, I think the U.S. Uh, and Japan, for that matter, we've both benefited tremendously from China's economic growth. Uh, looking at U.S. exports to China, it's, they're, they're increasing at a pace uh, greater than our exports to the rest of the world uh, combined. Um, and uh, Japan also, uh, for a very long period, 2002 to 7, uh, I think it qualifies as Japan's longest period of sustained economic growth. Much of that was uh, thanks to the uh, um, opportunities in China, both market and investment opportunities. Um, having said that, of course, um, there are uh, concerns. Uh, the South China Sea issue has been uh, mentioned, uh, but this is part of a broader um, trend in China um, under which it has accelerated its, uh, and, uh, its uh, program of military modernization in ways that are not entirely transparent. Um, so in, in such uh, domains as cyber warfare and space, uh, we all know about the uh, satellite tests that China carried out, uh, but also in modernizing its uh, nuclear forces, its naval forces, uh, uh, and uh, acquisition of uh, very uh, troubling anti-ship missile systems. Um, now this um, is combined with the uh, rather aggressive uh, posture it's taken with respect to the South China Sea and the territorial issues there. And what we've seen, I think, is a, re a very strong reaction on the part of the countries of that region uh, who have showed a, a willingness uh, to cooperate uh, in developing uh, multilateral mechanisms to resolve issues, uh, territorial disputes, and also uh, to ensure uh, the, the basic principles of freedom of navigation in the seas and respect for international law. Um, and of course, uh, in the case of Japan, we saw a very uh, troubling uh, incident uh, around the Senkaku Islands involving a Chinese fish fishing vessel and the reaction that the Chinese had to, to the seizure of that vessel. Um, so basically, uh, in sum, what we have here are you know, Japan, U.S., and China, the three largest economies uh, of the world, and uh, three of the four largest defense spending countries. Um, and uh, we um, in the United States uh, believe that it is absolutely essential that we cooperate, the three of us cooperate, uh, in order to maintain stability and prosperity. And uh, we are, of course, asking uh, others to participate, including China, uh, to help strengthen the uh, rules-based uh, system that uh, China benefited so much from. Uh, and uh, uh, hopefully going forward, we'll be able to, uh, to come up with a way. There's no, there's no uh, handbook. I have no uh, brilliant insights on how we're going to do this. I, I'm just simply underlining that um, for us, this is probably the most important issue in, in, Asia, in the Asia-Pacific region. Um, and finally, let me just uh, touch very briefly on uh, what I see as future changes in our alliance. Um, I, I noted earlier that this alliance really plays a central role in, um, in our efforts to maintain regional stability. Uh, but um, we, of course, can't rest on the past uh, success. We need to uh, adapt that alliance uh, to the uh, changing uh, security landscape. Um, one good example is uh, the cooperation we've had on ballistic missile defense, um, where we work now more closely with Japan than any other country on ballistic missile defense. Um, and this, this is basically a joint, uh, de jointly developed um, program. Um, in, in this regard, uh, Japan is now um, engaged in a review of its uh, three principles of arms exports. And, and uh, this, um, of course, is a domestic matter for the Japanese. But uh, if, in fact, uh, we saw some progress in that area, I think it would be beneficial in many other areas of defense cooperation, um, both with the US and, and other uh, democratic uh, countries. Um, we clearly work together in anti-piracy and peacekeeping operations and in responding to natural disasters. Uh, our uh, three MEF down in Okinawa has uh, participated along with uh, Japanese forces in um, 
responding to humanitarian situations. And of course, uh, we know that uh, we worked very closely with the self-defense forces in responding to the earthquake um, earlier this year. Um, additional areas, I think these were even outlined under the Hatayama government, uh, would be cybersecurity, um, uh, information security, and cooperation in space. Now, the uh, cybersecurity issue, I think, uh, has surprised uh, people recently with the extent of the intrusions that we're seeing uh, with M uh, Mitsubishi Heavy Industries and the Japanese uh, embassies, in addition to diet, uh, diet offices. Um, so this has really underlined, I think, the importance of addressing this issue together um, as allies. Uh, another area, of course, um, has been uh, regional um, participation of other regional players. Now, you, we, we heard um, a very good summary of who those players are. Uh, so far, um, in, in the case of US and Japan, we've worked mainly with the Australians and the um, South Koreans to some extent. But we're quite interested in expanding uh, to uh, trilateral cooperation with other important players that you mentioned, including, uh, for example, India, uh, would be a very uh, useful extension of this, this method of working. Um, and then finally, um, of course, um, we've been doing this all along, but we need to continue and to strengthen our efforts uh, to have our two militaries um, work better together. Th this is obviously important in a, in a budget-constrained environment, uh, having, uh, having more efficiencies working together, uh, defining what each of us does in certain contingencies. Um, can, uh, we can do more with less, obviously. Um, so we, we need to continue uh, to look at our respective roles and missions and capabilities. Uh, we need to do more joint training together. We need to <clears throat> have more joint facilities uh, that we, um, we use each other's uh, uh, facilities. And uh, this sort of effort, uh, I think we saw <clears throat> the benefits of it during Operation Tomodachi. Um, and uh, we're looking at that experience and, and we hope to build on the lessons that we learned there. And then finally, uh, just in this note, uh, I, I guess I, I would be remiss in not mentioning that Japan will be uh, uh, in the process of evaluating bids for its new, uh, new fighter aircraft. And uh, uh, we certainly hope uh, that uh, Japan will look very carefully at the merits of the U.S. Uh, proposals. Uh, uh, I think uh, in this respect, uh, interoperability and uh, the strong message that um, that kind of choice would make for the alliance is a uh, it's a very important factor to cons to uh, for the Japanese government to consider. So anyway, I'll stop there. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Robert, for outlining about the policy of the U.S. and the position that uh, the U.S. stands for. And uh, I cannot stop mentioning how gratitude, how great, grateful and uh, appreciation we have towards the Operation Tomodachi that we had after March 11th, <laughs> and uh, that showed who the friends of Japan are. And uh, at the same time, I think the current government has changed the foreign policy greatly uh, geared towards the uh, alignment with the U.S. in terms of the, uh, the U.S.-Japan, not only the U.S.-Japan, and the fact that they, the Prime Minister has chosen Korea uh, to be the first visit as a country. And then they're thinking of aligning with Australia and also the India and also Vietnam. And uh, that is, uh, at the same time, they are sending the message about the South China Sea issue as well. So uh, I think it's going to be quite interesting to see how it, uh, the policy of Japan moves forward. And th I think with that note, like, I'd like to hand over to Tanaka-san, who is the expert, a real expert on the foreign policy of Japan. And uh, after hearing uh, Philip's and Robert's uh, comments, as well as uh, if you have any like, uh, strategy and policy recommendation of what we should do as Japan, in this environment of the power balance changes in Asia. This is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, I would rather like to talk about uh, what we should be doing um, because we heard a very good summary of where we are and also U.S. strategy regarding the issue. So let me uh, talk about uh, what we should be doing to cope with the current situation. But before I do so, I would like to point out two important things. One is that we talked about decline of, relative decline of U.S. power, but we are indeed talking about relative decline of uh, what we call advanced industrial democracies. Not just U.S., okay. but as Japan and also European Union as well. We, uh, we, you, you know the reason why we are seeing a decline in the 
uh, United European power, and we also see the decline of Japan as well. Second important thing is the rise of China, associated with four essential elements. One, China grows much more rapidly than we expected. Second, Chinese military capability grows much rapid than we expected. Third, but yet China remains, still remains as a developing power, developing nation. <laughs> and fourth, China has got tremendous problems domestically, including the uh, enlarged, enlarged uh, uh, income disparity, the question of the political freedom versus economic freedom, the question of environment, question of the, uh, the uh, energy uh, efficiency, and all sorts of things. So China has got tremendous problems uh, ahead of them. We would very much like to encourage liberal forces in China. So having said that, let me talk about what we should be doing to cope with these two elements, the uh, rise of China, uh, which contains four elements, and also relative decline of power on the part of the advanced democracies. I propose to have uh, four key elements. Uh, United States often talks about China being a strategic competitor or a constructive stakeholder. I think that we no longer operate under the type of unilateralism of the United States. It may not be a good thing for us to define other countries uh, based upon our standard. Instead, we should, what we should be doing is to create a concept which include those nations. And I would like to categorize my sort of concept as concept of enrichment or enhancement. What we must be doing is enrich the security environment in the region, enhance the security environment, enrich the confidence in the region, enrich the opportunities, economic opportunities we have. So based upon that concept, by the way, uh, I, I said that uh, with the mind that United States must be seeing itself as a, a residential power. Uh, you talked about the United States wishes to maintain stronger presence in the region, but I would rather like to think that United States is already a residential power. So by saying that, uh, I would like to promote Four essential policies. First, first, how to enlighten, how to enrich the security environment. I would like to state that we should strengthen our partnerships, partnerships existing in the region. And top of the list is US-Japan uh, relations, US-Japan alliance. For that, we need to, uh, to place the question of Denmark as a relative issue, not an absolute issue between our two countries, we should sit down, uh, our two government officials need to sit down and broaden the scope of consultation and think about U.S. deployment in Japan in the context of the future, the future sort of security environment, how to enlighten uh, the security environment in this region. And I, for that matter, I do think that there is a need for the strengthened uh, functions on the part of the self-defense force in Japan. That uh, would be essential when we talk about the right mission, uh, roles and mission between Japan and the United States in the region. That's point number one. Point number two, let's talk about the strengthened partnerships with the major powers in the region. I talk about China plus five all the time. China, we need to develop a consultation a mechanism as well plus five, meaning India, uh, Vietnam, Indonesia, Australia, and Korea. Mm. I think by sort of developing stronger ties, we may be able to sort of develop 
a much better security environment in the region. Point number one. Point number two, let's talk about enlightened uh, confidence. Uh, you talked about the question of Japan, Korea, mm. and people think that there is uh, not much confidence in our relationship with Korea. I don't think so. The, I was surprised to see all these uh, uh, followers of uh, Korean actors and actresses <laughs> in Japan. I was coming back from Kyoto the day before yesterday, and in, 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 in the compartment, I saw a very pretty Korean man and a packed Japanese girls following him all the way from Kyoto to Tokyo. So I think there is a increased communication in the grassroots. And Chi Korea being the uh, 15th largest economy of the world, Korea is gaining tremendous confidence. They are competing with us in the third country and they are winning that competition in various nations. So I am optimistic about our relationship with Korea. Korea is indeed gaining strong, stronger confidence, and, and I think it's time for us not just to talk about bilaterals with Korea, it's time for us to talk about region and the world as well. So uh, the confidence building is very needed, and for that matter, uh, I think the trilateral confidence building measures between uh, Japan, United States, and China would be essential, because China considers all the time uh, the uh, U.S.-Japan Security Alliance as the, the other opposing sort of uh, structure in the region. So why not? We don't, why not have the trilateral Japan-United States-China uh, confidence building measure? Because what we need to be talking about, the question of transparency of military budget, transparency of military maneuvers, and transparency regarding various activities. So, Let's improve confidence uh, in the region. Third, let's expand our economic opportunities in the region. I think we are discussing about the question of TPP, and TPP is a linkage between the North America and East Asia, and I strongly support this. But at the same time, the Japanese government needs to talk about the East Asia economic integration as well, multilateral multilateral economic uh, partnership agreement as well. In order for us to be able to talk about TPP and also East Asia partnership agreement, you know what we need to be doing. That is the question of agriculture. With agri agri agriculture as it is, there is no way for us to pursue freer trade in the region and freer trade with the United States and other nations which consist of TPP. So the question of TPP, let us not be shy in recognizing. Mm, sure. The question of TPP is a question of how to reform our agriculture. And mm. we cannot sustain agricultural sector as it is now. Okay. The fourth element, mm. let's talk about the multilateral joint uh, cooperation, particularly in the field of energy because energy issue is very sensitive issue in the region, all this South China Sea, East China Sea, and also thing. Let's talk about joint cooperation, and I think East Asia Summit is the right format for creating the joint uh, energy cooperation in the region. Also, the issue like the safety of nuclear reactors, and issue like uh, saving energy technology, and also maritime safety in the region. So with those uh, joint cooperation uh, based upon East Asia Summit formation, I think we would be able to expand the opportunities in the region and also expand the, uh, the confidence uh, in the region as well. I should stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. san What I will do is ask one question each to the panelists and open up for questions so they can engage yourself to the panelists. One question I'd like to ask to Tanaka-san is that uh, we have two uh, governments, uh, Hatoyama and Kan, and it seems like the northern government is quite different from them. How do you assess you know, those uh, government differences and where, where the Noda is going, northern government is going? And I'd like to hear your comments about because you left the government already so you can be free to say whatever, whatever you want. So. 
Uh, basic shortcomings of two consecutive governments, uh, Hatoyama and uh, Khan, they did not have right strategy at all. Okay, they so talked a lot. They I agree. talked a lot. <laughs> they I'm, talked I'm about uh, <laughs> Ftema being outside. <laughs> they talked about 25 cut of CO2. So they talked about the, all this crisis management and no result whatsoever. Okay. The strategy is needed for the sake of implementing your statement, implementing your vision. Yeah. I would <laughs> like to see Noda, Prime Minister Noda, will employ right strategy so that he could arrive at result. Yeah. We no longer, I mean, all those statements are not needed any longer. What we need is the result. So I am very much hopeful yeah. that this government will produce right result regarding the rehabilitation of Tohoku, yeah. question of the uh, tax increase, yeah. and question such as the, uh, the social security, yeah. and also this external policies, yeah. in particular, yeah. how to cope with China, yeah. and also how to repair the relationship with the United States. We need a I result. See. So you, have a, you must have inside the channel to find out what the government is thinking about. So if you feel optimistic about the direction that Japan is going forward right now under the administration? Remains to be seen. Okay, so I feel more optimistic than before. And uh, you know, we talked about G1 summit and Nagashima-san, Akisa san is on the G1 summit from the beginning and he seems to be in power and he has a very good strategy to outline about what, where Japan should be heading. So I'd like to ask Philip about, you said that you are skeptical about China. Please let us know about, like, uh, you mentioned some, uh, some part of it, but uh, you live in Hong Kong, which is a part of China, even though it's a two, part, two different systems. But we'd like to hear more about your insights as to what's happening. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, if I can first just uh, say oh, a please. word about the, the, sure. the last question, is that, that uh, I think people, yeah, I, I'm a, I, I don't live in Japan and I'm not an American, but I, you know, people looking at this situation from the outside mm -hmm. are very disappointed that, you know, here we have all these arguments of who in Japan, is it Mr. Noda or Mr. X or Y, mm -hmm. who's in not doing things or should be doing, and yet, you know, the fundamental issues of, you know, uh, U.S., uh, Japan uh, cooperation, military cooperation, uh, remain you know uh, uh, problematic, and people outside can't really understand why. Uh, people outside can't really understand why uh, Japan has been so docile in uh, its relations with Southeast Asia. Where I mean, if you go back 20 years, you know Japan was was everywhere. You know, investment, people there, and cultural links, and and uh, and they've let the whole thing just you know be. China taking the initiative in every in every direction, and I think you know that uh, that's something which is very noticeable from the from the outside. Okay. And how much it's connected to Japan's domestic politics, I, I I'm not in, in a position to uh, to comment. But anyway, uh, that's just the view from the outside. As for China, uh, why am I? Well, I'm I, I'm not sort of totally negative about China, particularly in the next five years. I I, I can see that it can continue on this path for quite. Uh, for you know, for another five years, maybe a bit longer, uh, but we have you know a, a number of things all coming together. Um, uh, first of all, the reliance on exports as a as a you know um, driver of growth is, it seems to me to be simply impossible um, much longer for the reason that a the developed country markets are static and will remain pretty much static. Um, Developing country markets uh, will continue to grow, uh, but you're seeing increasing opposition to uh, Chinese uh, manufacturers entering, uh, on whether it's under free trade agreements or GATT or, or, or sorry, WTO or, or what have you. And uh, I give an example, and I think it's a very important one, uh, Brazil's latest uh, tariff increases, which are quite obviously directed very much at, uh, at China. And you'll be seeing more, I am sure, of, of the same sort of thing in, in India and uh, to a lesser extent in, in Southeast Asia, certainly in Indonesia. So, um, yes, uh, China will continue to uh, have some export growth, but the idea that export growth can be, uh, continue to be 
uh, the driver of, of uh, the broader economy, I think, is mistaken. Uh, secondly, you have uh, a peaking of the workforce in China. It's happened probably this year, it's probably peaked. So that in itself tells you that the rate of growth will, will slow down. Because uh, you want to compensate, you've got to raise productivity, and that is going to become increasingly difficult. Again, for you know, you've got in rural areas aging populations, uh, you've got all kinds of environmental issues, um, and then looking further ahead, of course, you've got uh, uh, excessive expenditure on military compared with uh, uh, other uh, investments in in, uh, in broader education and so on. Um, I think there's ways in which, I mean, you can see, this is not a, obviously a precise parallel, but between what happened in the Soviet Union and what's uh, happening in China. Uh, China obviously is a much more open economy, but whether it will remain so is, is I, I, I suspect, questionable if uh, it is no longer able to be have export-driven growth. It will look much more uh, internally, and that will ultimately uh, quite likely lead to more protection, return to a more protectionist attitude. But uh, the reason I cite the Soviet Union is a very high rate of, uh, of, of investment, uh, but not very productive investment. Uh, if you look back to uh, 1960 or so, uh, when, when I was at university, um, people were talking about when is, uh, when is the Soviet Union going to catch up with the United States? Will it be five years or ten years? Well, you know, here we are 50 years later, and it's much further behind. Um, and the reasons for that are a very bad choice of investment, excessive spending on military uh, capability, and a political system which simply does not support uh, an advanced economy. So uh, all those things uh, exist in, in, in embryo in China today. Um, and perhaps in more than an embryo in, in, in some, some aspects. So although I, as I say, I think that China will continue to show rapid growth for five years or so mm. after that, uh, it's a different story altogether. And I won't bore you with, with all the demographic details, but they are fairly horrendous when you've got, you know, 20% more boys than girls. <laughs> okay. Um, the question to you, Robert, is that uh, I heard that uh, John, uh, Ambassador John Roos quoted as saying that uh, he has to face fourth foreign minister in less than, two, in less than three years. And, uh, and Tanaka-san has mentioned that uh, you know, the former administration with Hatoyama and Khan did not have any strategy or policy, you know, and, and that was really bad. This is what I'm saying. <laughs> and then uh, the question to you is that what do you expect from the Japanese government you know, moving forward. And you mentioned about three principles of, uh, of uh, uh, war arms you know, uh, should be abolished. You mentioned that this is an uh, internal policy of Japan. But uh, we'd like to hear more about what do you expect, you know, if, even though it doesn't matter whether it's an internal policy or not. Like we'd like to hear your opinion about what should be done and what should be changed. Um, thank you. Um, let me let me just start by uh, saying that uh, um, when the DPJ um, won the election and came to power, um, the United States uh, obviously was uh, fully supportive of that transition, and we, we we thought it was a you know a great step forward for Japan as a democracy and. Um, uh, and and the immediate uh, result. Um, in, in a couple of areas uh, that we saw, the re review of the uh, FATEMA uh, uh, relocation proposal and the, and the roadmap and so on. Um, at the time, um, we basically were willing to take a kind of a, uh, a go slow approach. We, we thought it was natural that a new government that hadn't been in power needed time to look at this agreement and what was involved. Um, so I, I has, I don't want to um, downplay um, the the frictions that we experienced, but I, I would I also don't want to uh, to overplay them. Uh, from our perspective, our fundamental alliance was pretty strong throughout um, that that period. I mean, we did have these issues that were troubling, and the the other one, of course, was um, um, Mr. Hatayama's um, Asian. Um, 
community notion, and and that that was uh, you know I think to be honest, uh, <laughs> perhaps not that well thought out um, at the beginning of the Hatoyama administration, but. Um, so, okay, let's so we, forget about Hatoyama I can't. <laughs> <laughs> let's look at the future. What do you expect? Okay, well, <laughs> I, I think, um, as uh, Hitoshi just mentioned, uh, the Noda administration is, uh, I think, back to a much more pragmatic, uh, results-oriented approach, which uh, we clearly applaud. So let's, um, um, we in the United States uh, support his efforts to uh, make progress in, in some of these difficult areas. Now, the FTEMA issue, uh, we understand the political sensitivity of that issue. And uh, um, let's talk about political sensitivity. What do you expect? What do, what do I expect of Japan? <laughs> well, yeah, I expect, uh, I, I certainly expect that um, the issues I laid out in terms of how we're going to deepen our alliance are going to okay. be uh, number one number uh, priority. One. Okay. Um, I think um, going forward, uh, we need to work on, on this China question uh, very hard. I mean, it, you know, everybody says we need uh, greater uh, mechanisms for ensuring uh, communication, security, that uh, we don't want accidents in the maritime domain and so on, but um, very little is happening. So we, we, need, we need to sit down with Japan and we need to sit down with China and, and discuss how we're actually going to do this and what, what, mechanism, what is the best path to, to go forward with China. Um, and I guess, uh, you know, the third area I would, I would point out is that Japan has been uh, tremendously helpful in, in the global arena as well. I mean, they've helped in a number of occasions. Uh, they've helped in Afghanistan. N nobody talks about that, but <clears throat> we, we welcome Japan in, in playing a constructive role in that area because it is an extremely important democracy. It's very supportive of the same principles that we support. And uh, Japan, without, without Japan, we really don't have the wherewithal to do a lot of the things that we want to do, whether it's ODA or, or other issues. So again, uh, for Japan to continue and even strengthen um, its cooperation in the global issues would be very okay. important. Okay, we'd like to open up for questions or comments. Yes, okay. Please. Yeah. About um, TPP, uh, do you think it's do you think it's actually in Japan's best interest from a political point of view to join the TPP, or do you think it's a fairly transparent effort by the U.S. to separate Japan from China? <laughs> good question. <laughs> a timely good question. I very much wanted to answer to that type of question. Uh, I think I think that's what. Well, sort of look back and, and uh, know the history of this TPP. TPP originally was a very small uh, sort of project, like P4. And the United States all of a sudden uh, took interest in joining and creating it as TPP. The reason why the United States wanted to do it is due to the movement on the part of East Asia Let's exclude the United States from the regional integration in East Asia. Japan ourselves thought that since NAFTA is there, why don't we have the economic integration in East Asia? But America thought that how could East Asia do this without the participation of the U.S.? So probably that's the reason why the U.S. Want, uh, wants to have the linkage with East Asia. And I think, we think that is very important for Japan to respond to it and to be willing to uh, facilitate that bridge between the North America and East Asia. But at the same time, at the same time, we need to push the concept of East Asia economic integration as well. Because Japan stands to gain by greater integration in East Asia. So, one must think that the TPP and East Asia can be uh, consistent. But one thing which is very, very needed for Japan is the question of reform in agriculture. A mm. uh, person like myself who worked very hard in, in relation to the question of economic friction with the United States in the 80s. I know that the United States has got very strong pressure <coughs> on Japan, so it may be possible for us to reform uh, agricultural sector with a very strong pressure from the US 
at the same time, at the same time, I think politicians need to talk about a vision. They talk all the time that we are losing out. But what is needed is a vision that, yes, we would like to create <coughs> the <coughs> huge economic integration, both in East Asia and <coughs> in the, the East Asian Pacific. And let's do the agricultural reform. Otherwise, we cannot survive. Let's move on to other question. Like, uh, who else has hands up? Like, I'd like to give you uh, a hand. Yoko okay. Ishiguro at okay. Keio University. Uh, my, I, I, well, in addition, before I ask my own question, I appreciate that uh, question very much because I'll be moderating the, the panel later on on TPP. So that's very helpful. Uh, my question to the panel is that uh, regarding the balance of power in Asia, what would be the biggest risk that you see which will affect uh, the balance of power? Anybody wants to take like that? Let's take up one, uh, one answer by one panelist per question. Anybody wants to talk about? Maybe Philip. <laughs> you have a smile on. <laughs> and uh, microphone to go to over there. Balance of power is shifting a little bit all the time, and I mean it's, it's a very complicated game now. So you know, because there's so many players, and the, but obviously you know the U.S. Uh, remains the most important single player. Um, it, it, you know, China is not the equal of the United States. I think we have to get that straight to, to start with, and uh, nor is it going to be in the in the foreseeable future. Um, what can upset? Oh gosh. Uh, I mean, you know, I personally, I don't see anything in the next five years which is going to, you know, seriously upset. I don't think. Uh, I mean, we've been worrying about Korea for a long time, and doubtless should carry on worrying about it. But again, uh, you know, there's the certain constraints on the Korean situation, just as there's certain constraints on the South China Sea situation, which seem to me to make it unlikely. Uh, they're going to face any uh, serious uh, problem of a, of a breakdown of the existing sort of balance within the, within the region. Um, if I could just say a word about the previous uh, question, um, as far as Japanese agriculture is concerned, uh, I mean, I, I would have thought that the way to put this is that actually what Japan's domestic economy needs is reform of the agriculture. I mean, and from that uh, will come the, 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 uh, the, the response for, in terms of trade. Okay, let's go on. Okay, over there. Um, can you hear me? Uh, I'd like to ask a quite very interesting discussion, gentlemen. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to ask a question of Mr. Bowering first and then a second question, if I may. Maybe one, one question. I'll one at a time. Okay. That's fair. Okay, fair enough. Um, okay, I'll put Mr. Bowering on the spot. You said that the Chinese political system uh, does not support an advanced economy. Uh, could you provide a definition uh, of a political system that does support an advanced economy and explain why the existing Chinese uh, political system does not support its advanced economy or its increasingly advanced economy, shall we say? Well, I would, you know, I would cite, I would cite the United States as an example of, however problematic some of its uh, uh, political structures are at the present time. It has long supported uh, the development of the American economy. As far as the Chinese economy is concerned, there is a, a very serious problem that most of the investment is going into a very inefficient public sector because public sector is controlled by the Communist Party, and the Communist Party is unwilling to give up control. The, the, the dynamic sectors in China are the, are the private sector, and that is where you would get the, the, the rate of growth which would uh, bring China eventually into the top uh, income league. But so long as you have the structure of the Communist Party and Communist Party control of the state enterprises and state enterprise control of a large chunk of the economy, then you cannot get there. Okay, over here. Um, regarding the um, balance of power um, in Asia and also about the advanced um, uh, economies, if you may, I, I don't know if, um, if it's a consideration, um, the usage of the internet, the, what it is, the digital life, because I work for a company that um, we devote ourselves to digital marketing and all our clients, most of our clients are IT companies, software companies, and what we're seeing of where this is going is just 
incredible and, and the balance definitely of power is in Asia right now. In number of users, but also the usage of how all these people are, are using the internet. And something that we're finding incredibly import, important and powerful is the ability to influence the world based on what you're doing. And a lot of that influence that we're seeing, it comes from Japan. I mean, a lot of, um, a lot of uh, countries, um, one of the, the criticism that they have is that uh, their inability of, um, of educating their people, that there's a, lot, you know, there's a lot of problems in education. Through the internet, through the use of the internet, um, uh, countries like Japan, they are educating already the rest of the world. Mm. I just see incredible um, influence from Japan through video games, mm. manga, videos, mm. you name it. And with the use of uh, Google Translate, mm. all of the, okay. um, the um, language barriers are being eliminated. So mm. I just find it incredibly empowering. Mm. Okay. Thank you for your comments. And over here. Please. Yes, thank you. Um, Mr. Baring mentioned, uh, don't forget about Russia. And uh, speaking of relative decline, Russia has a much stronger decline than the U.S. Does the panel think that there are still considerations for the role of Russia in security considerations for East Asia? Wow, maybe Rob did not comment, or maybe Philip, or Tanaka-san, or <laughs> maybe like Rob, you have not spoken for yeah. at the Q&A sessions, and I'm asking you. <laughs> I know Philip wants to talk. <laughs> Well, let's, let's have a robot. Well, um, I, I think <laughs> there uh, clearly are a couple of considerations regarding Russia. Uh, n number one is uh, what, what is their uh, relationship going to be going forward with, with China? And we, we see that playing out in various uh, four, including the UN. Um, so are, are they going to be, and, and I might add the EAS uh, as well. Um, there, there's potentially a, uh, a certain level of cooperation between Russia and China in, in the EAS on some issues that are uh, being considered there. Uh, and the other, of course, is uh, Russia's stance vis-a-vis -vis Japan and the settling the Northern Territories issue. And I'll defer to my uh, colleague here on that, on that question, but um, you know, our, our view is that uh, we, we haven't seen much progress in that area. Um, you know, I'm not sure with the return of Putin whether that's going to change that or not. Um, but in terms of uh, military um, threat um, in this region, um, I really don't think that you know people are taking it that seriously. Uh, it just doesn't seem to me that even the Japanese are terribly worried about the Russian threat. Um, and people lose sleep over China; they don't lose sleep over Russia. Okay. I'll We'll go back to that question maybe afterwards, but let's ask a question. Yeah, actually, um, I have a question about Russia a little bit as well, because you, um, Mr. Tanaka and Mr. Luke, you mentioned the okay. importance about the trilateral um, alliance, China, Japan, the US. Um, China has been historically very close to, to Russia. Does actually China want this, this alliance? The US and Japan, yes, of course, but how can we, my question is, how can we make China want this trilateral alliance that I think we all agree is very important. Maybe Tanaka-san. Okay. It's good to have I'm sorry, I wasn't options. talking about uh, the trilateral alliance between uh, Japan, US, China. I, I was talking about the need for confidence building measures, meaning that let us, uh, I mean, not align ourselves, but uh, to make sure that we know the um, precise budget, military budget on the part of China uh, and to some extent, we may be able to uh, think about joint cooperative movement, like the counter piracies, the cope with the accident on the sea, and all sorts of things. So by doing this, we may be able to uh, increase our confidence among ourselves. So uh, this is uh, the, the question of confidence building that should be uh, recognized as a different thing, uh, different from uh, the alliance. And the mechanism like six-party six talks, when it com accomplishes the uh, objective of denuclearization of Korean Peninsula, it may become the right regional confidence building uh, mechanism, which can, I mean, Russia is there as well. Uh, the question of Russia, if I may uh, add, uh, Putin coming back on the front scene of Russian uh, diplomacy 
I would expect Russia to be much more active in East Asia as well. Because Putin talks about a much stronger Russia. And uh, I think he has got certain strategy to uh, expand Russia's influence uh, in East Asia. The question the Japanese government has uh, in relation to that is that we have the question of territories, uh, northern territories, four islands. And in the past, we took a policy to sort of uh, delink Russia from East Asia. Because without resolving northern territories, how could we accommodate Russia in East Asia? That was a kind of policy we, uh, not explicitly, but tacitly was taking. But now, Russia is coming in the frontal way. Russia joined in East Asia summit. Russia sent president to the Northern Territories. I think government, the Japanese government, would have to make up their mind what should we be doing vis-a-vis -vis Russia. And that is an important question to this government as well. OK, so it's like a I'll get back to you later. Okay. Yes, I have a question about uh, the role of uh, businesses and business organizations, for example, because I think all of us around the world are losing a lot of confidence in the government, government leaders, and political system. And uh, especially looking at example like Korea or China, I think there's much more of a business sort of motivation within the governments or government leaders. So that is maybe one of the reasons why they are starting to have much more influence within Asia. So my question to uh, any one of you is, any ideas on what <clears throat> the role of businesses and business organizations uh, organization should be uh, within Asia? Let's, ask, let's go for one more question and then get back to the panelists to answer. Okay. Uh, yeah, I have a question. It's for Tan Tanaka-san only. Um, does Japan still consider themselves as a superpower? Uh, and wouldn't it be more appropriate to adjust the expectations and approach the world and China as a uh, middle country with middle power? Hmm. One more question, and then we'd like to get back to the panelists to the final remarks. Perhaps the gentleman would like to answer the lady's no, question. Okay. It's okay. We, we'll get back. Okay. okay. Well, I'm going to ask a really mean question that um, <laughs> everyone will hate me for. Um, the title of this panel, which has been very interesting, is The Changing Balance of Power in Asia. And one could submit, uh, if one were to... Um, advance a devil's advocate type of argument that the notion of the balance of power is an outdated uh, 19th okay. century uh, concept based upon uh, nation states as the main players in the world. And uh, as the gentleman just asked beforehand about the role of business um, in the East Asia or the Asian scenario, uh, might one not uh, put forth the idea that uh, entrepreneurs uh, non-state actors such as multinational corporations and uh, other actors on the world stage are playing as important, if not more important, a role in the uh, balance of power in Asia as uh, states, which the whole discussion so far seems to have been predicated upon. Okay, so let's go back to the panelists. You can take up any questions you like. You can make any remarks you, make, you might want to have, and then this will be the final, possibly the final remarks from the panelists. Who wants to start with this? Sure. If, if I can uh, start by going back to this Russian issue, because I think, you know, I think there's more to, needs to be said about Russia, because clearly Russia is not a threat in, in any historical sense any longer. Uh, it is greatly to be regretted that the Northern Islands issue was not resolved a decade or whenever it was ago, when it came closest, I think, to a resolution. Um, clearly, Japan has... Uh, strategic as well as economic interests in, uh, in improving its relationship with Russia, um, both in terms of uh, access to materials and in terms of uh, uh, its uh, uh, relationship with China. Because clearly, the, uh, what, are, what is the Russians' main fear in, in, uh, in Russian Far East and Eastern Siberia, and I, I do go to these places from time to time, is, uh, is China. 
I mean, China from a demographic point of view as well as China from a military point of view. So, uh, you know, Russia is going to need to uh, strengthen its position through economic development and uh, uh, maintain or, or re uh, invigorate its military uh, presence, particularly in, in Vladivostok and uh, Petropavlovsk. Um, which brings me to the question of balance of power. Well, I'm sorry, uh, it, it may be in certain countries that uh, business groups have uh, the power that you suggest used to belong to national governments, but I certainly don't think you could say that about China or uh, Russia. Okay, uh, Robert? Just a quick comment on, on the um, non-state uh, forces, I guess. Um, yeah, I, I think, you know, one, one thing that we, we haven't really focused on very much is, is, is the, the economic issues other than TPP. We haven't talked about uh, you know, the financial crisis or, you know, the currency alignments or all, all those sorts of things. So those are clearly other issues that are um, very important. But in terms of... Uh, in the role of the business community, um, you know, frankly, um, my long-term view of China tends to be a bit more optimistic than my friend up here on the panel. Um, and one, one reason um, I take that view is I, I do believe that uh, over time, um, a growing middle class, um, this private sector that was referred to as, as sort of being um, starved out by the state enterprises, I... I I don't think it is going to be started. I think ultimately the private sector in China is going to grow, and I think that those entrepreneurs and, um, and forces are, are going to uh, force some sort of political change. Now, how long that takes, I have no way of predicting, but I find it hard to believe that China's political system is going to remain completely stable in, in, with, with this um, level of economic growth. So, to me, um, that's a very important uh, dynamic, and, and it is playing out in China. It's, um, in the United States, we have our own set of challenges politically. Uh, we, we have the Occupy Wall Street movement and <laughs> various forces. So, I mean, you could say that uh, you know we're going through something similar, I, I suppose. But uh, my my uh, my my hope would be that um, within China, we would see those forces work. Thank you, well, Tanaka-san. Final comments. I, think especially related. I uh, would like to consider Japan not as a superpower, but as a big power, not in terms of size, but in terms of qualities. Right. I think Japan has got, still has got top-ranked technology and sort of workforce, uh, education, and everything. Uh, therefore, I would like to consider Japan to be a big nation with high quality. That leads to the question of role of business as well. Uh, and again, question of balance of power as well. Uh, I do think that this concept of balance of power is losing uh, its relevance in the actual world. But yet we may be seeing the confrontation between the two systems, particularly economic systems. The China runs an economy which uh, involves more state intervention. And we have a much freer economy, uh, the US, uh, much more freer. But yet, this may lead to the confrontation between two different systems, like the question of the uh, uh, currency. Uh, why Japan, uh, Japanese yen is so much appreciated? Because we are running a two different system, much more. Uh, you know, closed system like China and, and Japan, Europe, and United States. That's one of the reasons why we uh, see the appreciation of yen that much. Business. When you run a business in China, I'm sure you have various difficulties. Why don't us work together to improve the system in China so that, end of the day, we have a convergence of two different systems. And for that, business has a very distinct role to play. Thank you, Tanaka-san. And thank you, all the panelists. I have learned a lot. Uh, you know, like I was not expecting to be moderating this session. Uh, however, you know, um, as a moderator, I'd like to thank the panelists for 
giving us insights as to what is going on in, the, in Asia and uh, what is the relationship between those countries and what is the issues facing us, military, diplomacy, and also about economy. And uh, there are no solutions. It's, this, the, 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 you, uh, Robert mentioned about complex system, like a complex problem that we face in lifetime. And at the same time, there's a euro going somewhere, and uh, there are lots of issues in advanced nations, as Tanaka san mentioned. And, but we are the one to be uh, witnessing. At the same time, we are the one to be involved in the process as well. So thank you very much. And we'd like to like, uh, please join me in uh, thanking the panelists with a round of applause. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>